Okay. Chapter 4. This is the most important chapter we will go over in the entire semester. You absolutely have to know this stuff to do the rest of micro lecture and the rest of micro lab. I don't start this on day one because it's so important. I got to make sure everybody gets here and we all are ready to get going when we start chapter four. Chapter four teaches us the basic differences between prokaryotes and eukaryotes and helps you to understand how those cells function. Okay? So you tell me what is the difference between a prokaryotic and a eukaryotic cell? Uh-oh. Y'all can't even tell me the wrong definition y'all learned in biology class? A prokaryote lacks a nucleus. That's what you've learned. That's not really the right answer. The correct answer is prokaryotes do not have complex membrane-bound organelles. The nucleus is just the most complicated membrane-bound organelles. But if you just say the difference is prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, you're kind of missing out on some of the definition. Prokaryotes are not the simple, boring cells that you learn they are when you take a biology class. There are prokaryotic cells that are capable of doing just as much as some eukaryotic cells. They're not unevolved. They are just different. So what I kind of want to start with is Let's talk about a eukaryotic cell, because that's what you should know. And then I want to go into the prokaryotic cell so you can kind of learn the differences between them. Okay? The way you answer my questions will tell me what you know, so I know how deep and how far back in the biology we need to go. Okay? If I'm talking about something that you guys have never heard about, you need to tell me, because everybody has a different level of background knowledge when they get into this class. Is that a deal? All right, so here's, according to your textbook, differences between a prokaryote and a eukaryote. We're going to go over each one of these things in detail, so I'm not going to sit here and read this to you. This is for you to go back and look at as you're studying and make sure it makes sense to you. Okay? Now, I'm going to skip around your notes a little bit. Don't let it annoy you. I'm sorry. I just want to flip to this eukaryotic cell for just a minute. Okay? So this is probably that wonderful picture of a cell that you looked at when you took biology class, right? Looks horrific and complicated. And you should have learned the basic function of each organelle. And I want you to be able to remember that. I want you to be able to look at this picture, know what each of the organelles, each of the parts are, and what their function is. So, so let's kind of go through that together. Okay? I always like to do this starting from the outside and going in. The very outside of a eukaryotic cell can have a cell wall. It can. Does that mean all eukaryotic cells have cell walls? Do you have cell walls? No, you do not. Plants have cell walls. Okay? There are other eukaryotic cells that have cell walls, and we'll learn the composition of those as we go along. But you need to kind of just be able to say, yes, eukaryotes can or they don't have to have a cell wall. Okay? If we keep going further in on that cell wall, the next structure we'd come across would be the plasma membrane. What is the function of the plasma membrane in a eukaryotic cell? To allow certain things in and out. So it separates the internal and external environment of the eukaryotic cell, and it allows certain things to go in and out. Okay? Now, let's go on the inside and look at this. Now, a lot of the things I'm saying are written in your notes, but I just really like the picture while I'm going through it. Okay. So this big guy in the middle, this is the nucleus. What is the function of a nucleus? Why do you have one? It stores your DNA. Okay. Why do you need to keep your DNA in the nucleus? Can it leave if it wants to? No. It can't leave. Why do you put it there? Right. If something happens to your DNA, your cell becomes a, tum a tumorous or a mutant type of cell, and that cell is usually going to die. That DNA cannot or does not need to change. Okay? So we keep our DNA nice and sequestered in here inside the nucleus where it's safe. Okay? If we need more DNA, we can copy DNA, right? We do the, that by DNA replication. 
all of that takes place inside of the nucleus. Okay? So you may want to make a little note. If you don't know what DNA replication is, you may want to go back and, and read a little bit about that. That's something we're going to be using in this class that you should have already learned. Okay, I'm going to review it some at, at, at a point, but not yet. Okay? Now, the DNA is very important. If it changes, that cell can't live. Why do we have it? What do you need your DNA for? It's your blueprint. So what is a blueprint of a house? Helps you build house, right? So if your DNA is a blueprint for things in your body, that means your DNA stores the information to make other things that your body, your cells need, right? The most important thing that your DNA stores the code to make is a protein, okay? So you've probably at some point in the past learned about transcription and translation, right? Some of you shaking your head and agreeing with me. DNA is converted into something else that can leave the nucleus. See, anybody remember what that is? The messenger of your cell, messenger RNA. So the DNA is in here in the nucleus. We transcribe it into messenger RNA. The messenger RNA comes out here, and then we use the messenger RNA to make a protein. What organelle is the site of protein synthesis? The ribosomes. Good. You have free ribosomes in your cell, and you also have ribosomes on this little folded up stuff right here. What is this stuff? Not Golgi. That's the endoplasmic reticulum. They look similar. And most, people, most teachers never really tell you how to tell them apart. Okay? Endoplasmic reticulum is always attached to the nucleus. So you see in this picture how all the green stuff is right, wrapped around the nucleus? Okay? That is going to be endoplasmic reticulum. Okay? The Golgi, it's the orange stuff right here. See how it's not touching the nucleus? That's how you tell it apart. Because if you just look at it, I don't care how good of a drawing it is, you cannot tell them apart. Okay? Back to what we were talking about. This endoplasmic reticulum here, kind of below the nucleus, it's got the little red balls on it. That's the ribosomes. The endoplasmic reticulum with ribosomes is called rough ER. That's actually where you make most of your proteins. Okay? So the way this little situation kind of happens, your DNA inside of your nucleus is converted into mRNA. The mRNA comes floating out of this little hole right here in the nuclear membrane, goes right here to this little ribosome. You make a protein. Now we got a protein made, and it's right there. Is that where you need all of your proteins inside of your cell? Of course not, right? You need them everywhere. You need proteins on the cell wall. You need proteins in the plasma membrane. You need proteins in and around your nucleus. So we've got to have a way to sort and move those proteins where we need them, right? And that is the job of the Golgi apparatus. The way I always remembered it is your Golgi kind of acts like the post office. The Golgi gets the protein looks at it and says, okay, you're a nuclear protein. It then puts that protein in a vesicle and sends it to the nucleus. Or the Golgi says, oh, you're a plasma membrane protein. Wraps it up, takes it to the plasma membrane. Okay? And if you stop for a second and just think about it, that's pretty amazing, right, for something that intelligent to happen inside of a cell. Right? Think about it. When you're driving in your car, how do you decide which way you want to go? You have an entire organ, a brain, that helps you think about where you need to go, right? It's, um, that was part of my research that I did when I was working on my PhD, is figuring out the signals and how the different things know where to go. It's just fascinating that all that can happen inside of one little cell. And your Golgi is responsible for deciding where all of that stuff needs to go. Okay? Does that make better sense than maybe what you've memorized in the past about what those organelles do? You don't want to ever memorize the definition. You want to understand how it fits together. Okay? So let's look at some of these other organelles and see if you remember what they do. All right, we got this guy right here that has a membrane on the inside. He's called a mitochondria. What does he do? He's the powerhouse of the cell, right? That's what you always memorize. What is made inside of the mitochondria? ATP, energy. Okay? That happens in the mitochondria, and it is an essential function for life, the ability to produce energy. If you don't remember how that happens, 
That is chapter 5. That's where we're going next. We're going to make sure you remember how that happens. Okay, we're getting there. Just need to know it's happening inside of there. What is that energy that we make inside of the mitochondria used for? Every, everything. That's not, not a bad answer, right? Every one of those steps we just went through, DNA turning into mRNA, that requires energy. That has to have energy for that to happen. Taking the mRNA, turning it into a protein, that requires energy. Okay? So we've got to have it for every function we do inside of our cell. Okay? Um, these little green things right here, they are lysosomes. Does anybody know what that's for? takes away stuff that we don't need anymore. Okay? They're kind of the garbage disposals of your cell. They contain little enzymes inside of them that um, can digest things. Now, what you've probably talked about before is, let's say as we're in the process of making our protein, we made one that was messed up. Well, if it's, if it's bad, we don't want to send it somewhere, right? So your Golgi will then send it to the lysosome. Lysosome will break it down and send the parts back so you can reuse them. Now in micro class, we're going to learn that's the way our immune system kills a bacteria that gets into our cell that's not supposed to be there. So it's got lots of functions we're going to go through. Okay? Now the other two on this side, the really big organelles, they're not found inside of our cells, but they're found in eukaryotic cells, and that's a vacuole and a chloroplast. What is the vacuole for? Temporary storage site. Probably talked about them when you talked about plant cells. They store food supplies in their vacuoles. What is the chloroplast for? Converting sunlight into energy and food. Okay? And if you don't remember how that happens, I'm going to remind you about that in Chapter 5 too. Okay? Last little thing on here is the flagella. What's the flagella for? movement. Okay? A eukaryotic cell is very intelligent as far as it can decide where it wants to go and it uses its flagella like a tail and it whips it and if it wants to go over there, it can whip its flagella and take itself straight to that point it wants to go. And you're going to see why I point that out. That's important. A prokaryotic cell can't quite do that the same way. Okay? So was that a review for most of the people in this room? It, it should have been a review for a lot of you. Okay? Now, those of you that aren't used to me, let me show you something real quick. You can see the, the things that I was saying to you. It's all written here for you, right? Okay? I don't ever expect you to frantically try to write down everything I say. I just don't, I don't read slides. Okay? Does anybody have a question about the eukaryotic cell? Do you guys kind of understand how that how they all, all the little pieces work together. Okay. Now what we're really going to spend some time talking about in this chapter are the things that I don't think you've learned a lot about. And that is all of the components of this guy. This is the prokaryotic cell. Now does this look like the prokaryotic cell drawing they probably showed you in biology class? Right? A lot of times they kind of just show you this big empty circle with a tail on it, and they say, okay, this is what a prokaryote looks like. They don't have any organelles, and they don't do anything. And that is so far from the truth. Does a prokaryotic cell have organelles? Does it have stuff on the inside of it? It does. A prokaryotic cell has organelles. The organelles are just simpler. The prokaryotic cell is a little bit reversed from the eukaryotic cell. The complexity of a eukaryotic cell was on the inside, right? That's where we were talking about all that stuff going on. The complexity of a prokaryotic cell is the outside. The prokaryotic cell can do pretty much anything a eukaryotic cell can do, but it can do it without all of the organelles. So maybe I'm a little biased, but I actually think that makes this one a pretty smart little guy. He can do just as much. He just doesn't need all the junk to do it with. But he can do the things the eukaryotic cell can do. So as we go through all of these parts, we're going to go through them a lot slower and in a lot more detail, I want you to constantly be thinking, 
How is that different from the eukaryotic cell? A good way to study this is to, and it's in one that I think it's in your study guide I made for you. you can kind of make you a table, list all the parts, and then is it in a prokaryote, is it in a eukaryote, how is it different? Okay, so that's, that's kind of how your mind needs to be going. So let's, we're going to start on the outside and move in. Okay. Now, one thing we need to go through that we don't ever talk about with a eukaryotic cell are basic shapes. And that's because eukaryotic cells, they don't really have these basic shapes for you to learn. But every prokaryotic cell on Earth fits into one of the three basic shape categories. No matter what you do to them, you can smush them, and you can see we're going to be pretty mean to them in micro lab, and they're still going to maintain one of these three basic shapes. Your three basic shapes are coccus, bacillus, and spiral. A coccus-shaped cell is spherical, so when you look at it on the microscope, it looks like a circle. Okay? A bacillus-shaped cell is rod-shaped. So when you look at it under the microscope, you get this image here in blue. The bacillus can vary a lot in size. And I think that throws a lot of you off when we start really looking at them under the microscope. You may have a bacillus cell that is pretty tiny, but it still has that shape. Or you may have a bigger one that's really, really long and skinny, but it's still a bacillus. It's still a rod. Or you may have some that are really, really fat, but they're still a rod. So all three of these would still be just considered a bacillus-shaped bacteria. The third shape, the spiral, there's three different subcategories in the spiral. So if I drew a spiral on the board, okay, that's just a spiral shape, right? If I just looked at this one little part of it, that kind of, I think that kind of looks like a comma or like one little rainbow or something like that. Some of the bacteria only get that one little segment of a spiral, and those are the ones that we call vibrios. And they, well, and if I drew it more realistically for you guys, kind of looks like somebody took a bacillus and bent it. Those are going to be vibrios. The spiral, or the spirillum, excuse me, the spirillum is the basic spiral. But then some of them, so this one here, spirillum, some of them aren't just the spiral shape. Some of them look like you've grabbed both ends and just kept twisting and kept twisting and kept twisting until you got a really, really, really kinky little guy. And once you get it really kinky like that, that one is called a Spirochete. Okay. So I guess the spiral category is a little bit more complex just because a spiral is a more complex shape than a circle. There's only one way you can have a circle. Okay. So you need to get used to those. We're going to be seeing that a lot. Since bacteria sometimes, or prokaryotes, and sometimes have a harder time accomplishing some of their functions individually, they live in groups or clusters. When they live in a group or a cluster, we give it a prefix name as to how many of the cells are interacting with each other and how they're interacting with each other. If you have two cells hanging out together, we call those a diplo. Okay? So a diplococcus would be what? Two circles hanging out together. Okay? A diplobacillus would be to bacilli. Anytime you end up with a diplobacilli or a bacilli like that, it's going to be kind of hooked together end to end. One of the most common bacteria I use in the lab is Bacillus megatherium. And they're really long, skinny bacilli. And they kind of look like pieces of rice on a, on a string or something like that. You'll, you'll get used to those. They'll be all over all your slides when you get in there. Okay? If you have more than two, hooked together, they start to what we call chain out, forming a chain of the bacteria. We call them strepto. Okay? So this would be streptococci. 
streptobacilli. Okay? So you guys have all heard strep throat, right? Okay? Why do you think it's called strep throat? It's caused by a bacteria that looks like this when you look at it under the microscope. It's caused by streptococcus pyogenes. So if you looked at that, if you had strep throat and we swabbed the back of your throat and looked at it under the microscope, it would look just like this under the microscope. So the word strep doesn't mean horrific sore throat. The word strep means the bacteria look like a chain under the microscope. Okay? The only other possibility you may see only occurs with the cocci, and it looks something like this. This is what we consider a random cluster. Okay? The random cluster is called staphylo. So this would be a staphylo, staphylococci. Okay? So again, you all heard of a staph infection, right? Staph does not mean funky sore on your arm. Staph means if you look at the bacteria under the microscope, they're going to look like a cluster of grapes. Okay? This is going to be one of the common things you see in lab as well. Not because I'm going to give it to you a lot, but because you have this all over your body. So you guys tend to shake it off or, sneak or breathe it out of your nose onto your microscope slide. So you'll see that a lot as we get in lab as well. Okay? So that's easy enough, right? Okay? So now let's get back to our structures. I needed to show you that because that's going to be a lot of the pictures we see as we go through. All right. First thing you may come in contact with as you're looking at a prokaryotic cell going from the outside in is something called a glycocalyx. A lot of you have probably never heard this term before. Eukaryotes do have glycocalyces, but not anything that is really important for their function. So you usually don't talk a lot about them when you're talking about eukaryotic cells. But with a prokaryotic cell, the glycocalyx can be and is usually very, very important. A glycocalyx is anything that is secreted on the outside of the cell, and it's usually going to be majority made of sugars. So it's kind of like just a, a sugar layer secreted on the outside of a prokaryotic cell. Sometimes there's going to be some proteins mixed in with the sugar. But that's, that's really minuscule is what we're talking about. It can look differently depending on how the sugar and the proteins link together and how it's secreted. So I bet you can figure it out. If I had sugar in my hand and I sprinkled a little bit of water in it, how's that sugar going to feel? I mean, it's kind of slimy and sticky, right? Okay. So if I'm a bacteria, and I have just secreted this really slimy, sticky stuff all on the outside of my body. What's that going to help me to do? Stick, right? So if I'm flowing down somebody's intestines, I'm going to act really stupid for a little while. If I'm flowing down somebody's intestines and I'm sticky, I'm going to go a lot slower, right? Because I'm going to be sticking to the wall. That's going to help me because I don't have arms and legs, right? So if I want to slow down, that's one of the things I can do. I can secrete something real sticky on the outside of myself, and I can stick to something. Whenever the glycocalyx is super, super sticky, we call it a slime layer, which the name kind of explains what it does. You all could look at these tomorrow morning if you would like. Before you brush your teeth, when you wake up in the morning, before you brush your teeth, well, it's 11 o'clock. We probably do it now because y'all probably haven't brushed your teeth since early this morning, right? But in the morning, this is your homework. Before you brush your teeth, take one of your fingernails and scrape the outside of your teeth a little bit. Okay? You're going to have a white, slimy something underneath your fingernail. Those are bacteria. They are hanging onto your teeth by their slime layer type of glycocalyx. Okay? Why do you why do you have bad breath in the morning? Because you got bacteria growing in your mouth overnight, right? Why do they grow better overnight than they have been in the last few hours? Because you're not swallowing, you're not making saliva and talking and eating and things like that at night. So as they're sitting in your mouth, they got that slime layer and they just start all sticking together. Okay? It's a nice thought, right? All right. Now the other type of glycocalyx 
is not quite as slimy. It's much more organized. It will be a piece of sugar than a protein. Then sugar, sugar, protein. Forms a perfect capsule around the cell. And so we call it a capsule. Okay? So let's see if you can figure out what it's for. When you take a Tylenol that has a capsule on it, why do you have that capsule on the Tylenol? It makes it go all the way down your throat, right? It's easier to swallow, makes it nice and smooth. It goes all the way down. Does anything happen to it as it's on its way down your esophagus? No. Nothing happens to it until it gets in your stomach acid. That capsule keeps you from digesting it until it gets to the point that the pharmaceutical company wanted it to get to, right? The bacteria secrete those on themselves. That way, when your immune system starts trying to kill them, it's harder for them to kill them because they have that protective coating. So they can't be digested quite as quick. Even farther than that, some of them just make such a thick capsule that your, your immune system cells work by phagocytosis. They literally try to grab the bacteria and eat it. Sometimes those bacteria get so big with their capsule, your little cells can't grab them and eat them. So they can just float through your body without being destroyed by, by your phagocytic cells simply by putting sugar on the outside of their bodies. Okay? So already, is that as simple as most people think bacteria are? No. It's pretty smart in my opinion, right? Okay, so that's the glycocalyx. Now we need to look at what I call appendages. Okay? There's three appendages on the outside of prokaryotic cells. Prokaryotes can have one of these types, two of them, all of them, it just depends on the prokaryotic cell. The three appendages we're going to go through are the flagella, the fimbriae, and the pilli. So we're going to talk about how they're different and what they do. Okay. Let's start with the one that you guys think you know the most about, and that's the flagella. So I say you think you know a lot about it because you already know its function, right? What's the function of flagella? Movement. That is the only thing in common with a prokaryotic and a eukaryotic flagella. Both cell types use it for movement. They don't look anything alike. They're not composed of the same things. They do not move in the same way. The only similarity is that they're both used for movement. The prokaryotic flagella is actually much more organized and much fancier than the eukaryotic flagella. But it just doesn't have quite as much intelligence to help it know where it's supposed to go. Okay? <coughs> With a eukaryotic cell, you're going to usually just have one flagella. Sometimes two or three, but usually just one. The only flagellated cell in the human body is a sperm. It has one flagella. Okay? With the prokaryotic cells, you may get lots of different arrangements of flagella. And the base word we use to tell us that a prokaryote has flagella on it is the word tritious. And so we're going to put some prefixes in front of that word. But if you ever see tritious, that should pop in your head. OK, I'm talking about flagella. Okay. If a bacteria looks like this. Well, that's, that's an ugly drawing. Let me, let me make that better. OK. So what shape is this? Bacillus. OK. He has one flagella, right? So he would be what we call monotritious. Now I'm just being lazy. That word tritious goes at the end of everything. OK. Monotritious. Some of them will look like this. So how's that one different? He's, he's got more than one flagella, right? But they're all at one pole, one end. So we call this one lophotritious. And then that's kind of a weird prefix. The word lofo means tuft. But I, I, that's not a word that I normally use. But tuft kind of means just collection in one area. Okay. All right, let me change it up a little bit. We could have what type of cell is this? 
All right, screw it on my spider key. It's kind of hard to tell the way I drew it. But yeah, it's a spiral shape. He's got one flagella at each end. Okay, He's what we call amphitricious. Amphi means opposing. Like an amphitheater has the opposing big tall seats. Okay, so mono, lofo, amphi. Oh, I know what I'm missing. Okay, and then the other one is going to look like this. All right, he's got flagella everywhere. He's got many flagella, so he's going to be called peritricious. Okay. Now, when I told you as we went over the syllabus that your question, your exams would have what I call short answer questions, we give you a short answer question. I usually do, or I have in the past. Draw a lophotricious bacillus. A a bacillus bacteria with a lophotricious flagellar arrangement. That sounds like a horrible question, right? But it's not. You would draw a bacillus, right? And you draw a bunch of flagella at one end. That's the answer to what I call a short answer question. Does that make a little bit more sense about what I was trying to explain? Okay? So you just you this is kind of like the, the shapes. You just kind of have to get familiar with that because we're going to use that a lot. Okay. Every time we look at a flagella, I'm going to flip to the picture a little bit. Each one of the flagella, flagellum, excuse me, they're going to have three basic parts. You're going to have the basal body, the hook, and the filament. Okay. The way this works, I'm trying to draw a lot. You don't have to draw it. Just I just like to. Okay. So, I'll tell you what, do it this way. If my arm is a flagella, okay, the basal body is going to be my forearm. Okay? My forearm can't bend in half, right? Doesn't move that way. The basal body is just one solid shaft-like piece that sits inside of the cell wall. Okay? It doesn't move, so it's what we kind of think of as the anchor. It's just what holds it in place. Okay? Now, the next thing we'll be talking about a little down the road will be um, the cell wall. And you'll understand what the difference, why they show you two pictures. Because the cell walls can be different, so the basal body looks a little different. But don't worry about that now. Just look at one picture. So that's the basal body. That's the anchor. Then, as the anchor comes out, you have the hook. So basal body, then the hook. The hook turns at a perfect 90 degrees. Sticking out of that hook is the little tail-like part. That's the filament. Okay. So since I have these two parts that are stuck in this shape, do you think the flagella is going to come back out here and whip? It doesn't make a lot of sense, right? You would never see a dog that had his tail come out and have a piece that came straight down, right? and then tried to wag in the back. It wouldn't make any sense. So obviously that's not how this flagella is going to move. The flagella of a prokaryotic cell works like a helicopter propeller. And some of you will go, oh, and then some of you will go, how the heck am I supposed to know how that works? So I'm going to explain it to you. There's two ways this flagella can move. It's stuck like this, right, sticking out of the end. It can either turn this way, which my arm won't go all the way around, it can turn this way and go around, or it can turn this way and go around, right? So those differences are going to be clockwise or counterclockwise. Everybody still with me? Okay. The way a helicopter works, it's sitting on the ground, right? Then all of a sudden the propellers start turning and the helicopter lifts off the ground, right? Okay. So how, do you th how does it lower? Do they just stop? And free fall? No, of course not, right? Whenever the propellers go in one direction, that makes the wind draft pick up the helicopter. So when a helicopter wants to land, they go in the other direction. Not, not compl they don't like completely stop, but they switch angles, right? And that makes the wind draft go the other way, so the helicopter will go down. The way bacteria or prokaryote works is if I want to go over there. I can't just say it. I'm going to head out this way and go over here. Doesn't work that way. I'm going to 
take all of my flagella, regardless of how they look, the first thing I'm going to do is rotate all of them clockwise. When I rotate them clockwise, that makes me randomly tumble and go around. Okay? I'm not a helicopter. Helicopter knows it wants to go up and down. Prokaryote just knows I have two options by spinning them different ways. Okay? So I'm going to go clockwise and I'm going to tumble. Then I'll stop. Now I'm going to switch them and I'm going to rotate them all counterclockwise. That makes me what is called run. Go in a straight line. So am I going where I originally wanted to go? Well, I wanted to go over there. So I'm getting there, right? But if I keep going in this direction, am I, am I ever going to get over there? So I'm going to stop all my flagella, turn clockwise again, and tumble, and tumble, and tumble, and then just stop. I don't know where I'm going to land, but I'm going to stop. Then I'm going to switch them counterclockwise. Go straight. Whoops, still not where I wanted to go, right? So I go back clockwise, tumble, all right? Land. Then I'm going to go counterclockwise, run. Now I'm going to get to where I want to go. Is that the greatest way to ever get to where you would like to go? Eh, probably not. But I am a bacteria, so I have to kind of take what I can get. I can still get exactly where I want to go eventually. I'm, so I'm going to use what I have. The only way I can move is with my flagella. It's got that specific angle, so it can only go two ways. My only two options are randomly tumble or go in a straight line. That make sense? Okay, let's see if it makes sense. Give you two scenarios. So I am a prokaryotic cell, and I'm standing right here, and there's a big yummy piece of sugar over there that I would really like to ingest. Okay, so what do you think is going to happen? Am I going to just do a whole bunch of tumbling, or am I going to do some tumbling and a good bit of running? So think about it. I got to do them both, right? I got to tumble just long enough to end up in the direction I want to go, and then I'm going to want to run. I'm going to want to get to that. So here's the other scenario. I'm hanging out here doing nothing wrong. And some germaphobe comes and sprays Lysol all over me. What am I going to do now? I got to get out of there, right? But I, I don't know which way to go, right? So he doesn't run because what if he starts running this way and that's where the Lysol is coming from? Well, that's not good, right? They start frantically tumbling because they don't know which way to go. And it's a really fun thing to do underneath the microscope if you want to torture them. Once, if you got to do a live mount. But if you do a live mount and you start terrorizing them, putting stuff on them that will hurt them, they all start just freaking out and tumbling all over the place because they don't know what to do, and that's their only method to get away. Okay? It kind of reminds me of, have you ever been mean to a dog and put it like under a blanket to see what it would do? You got that before I went as a puppy. You put it under a sheet or something and watch it like freak out and just go in all the directions trying to figure out how to get out from under it. That's kind of how a bacteria acts. It's kind of that survival instinct, just freak out and go all different directions. Okay? Does that make sense? So what do you think a bacteria would want to go to? What's going to make it want to do some running and go this way? What's a good thing to a bacteria? food. Okay? The only other thing would be possibly um, sunlight. Some prokaryotes, some bacteria are photosynthetic, so they have to be able to go towards sunlight. If they're trying to get to it, that's called positive taxis. Taxi meaning move. So positive chemotaxis. Ooh, chemical. I want to eat this. Uh, ooh, light. Positive phototaxis. So if it's a negative taxis, what does that mean? It's trying to get away from it. So a negative chemotaxis would be you sprayed Lysol on it. They're running the other direction. How many of you ever considered the fact that the, the bacteria could run when you started trying to kill them? Most people never really have that thought, right? You think, I'm going to spray the Lysol on the door handle and I'm just going to kill them. As soon as you spray that Lysol, most of them are gone because they're getting the heck out of Dodge, just like you would do. Somebody started trying to massacre you. Okay. All right. So right now we're thinking, 
Oh my god, that was flagella. Is she serious? The flagella is a little bit more detailed than a lot of the other structures. But we are going to learn in these prokaryotic structures in a lot of detail, okay? Our other two appendages we said we were going to talk about are fimbriae and pili. The top picture on your slide right here, these are fimbriae. What do they kind of look like? Kind of like hair. It kind of looks like a peritricious flagella. Very good. That was what I wanted somebody to think about. How can you tell it's not a peritricious flagella arrangement? The cimbriae are very, very, they're all attached around the edge, right? And very straight. When you see flagella, they're always going to have some bend to them. Fimbriae are always going to look like a porcupine quill, perfectly straight. Okay? And that kind of tells us what they do. They are used for attachment. The easiest place I can come up with to tell you where they're found is inside of your intestines. Okay? If I'm a bacteria living in your intestines, why do I need to hold on? Because other stuff's leaving, right? Things are flowing through there all the time. If I don't want to get pushed right out with the poo, I don't have a way to hold on. So inside of your intestines, and that's actually that's a picture of E. coli from an that's an intestinal E. coli. All of these fimbriae would be stuck into the mucosal membrane of your intestines. Seems kind of painful, but it doesn't hurt, obviously, or you would all be clenching over in pain. But that's just how they hold on. Okay. Now, fimbriae are in no way related to cilia. Haven't even said that word yet, right? I kind of did that on purpose. I don't even really want you to think about cilia. You can never have cilia in a prokaryotic cell. That's found on very few eukaryotic cells. So it's best that you just don't even think about them in this class. Because I love to use that as a wrong answer, and I don't know why y'all like to pick it. Okay? There's no such thing as a cilia on a prokaryotic cell. These are the only three appendages you can have on a prokaryotic cell. Okay? The last appendage are called pili. Pili is plural. A pilus would be singular. Okay? So in this picture right here, we've got three prokaryotic cells. Three, they're all bacillus shaped, right? Okay. All of these cells have fimbriae. See kind of what looks like a blurry halo around the edge? That's the fimbriae. These long extensions here, they are pili. If I'm a prokaryote, what I'm going to use my pillows for is if I have developed some sort of advantage that's helping me live, I will create a pillows. It's not always just hanging out there. Whenever I decide I have some advantage, something I want to share, I will slowly make that pillus, stick it out, and poke it into the cell wall and the cell membrane of another prokaryotic cell. And then I'll send a piece of DNA that's coding for my advantage, and I'll send it to that other one. Okay? But if you notice in this picture, is this just two bacteria in one pillus? No. They exchange DNA very, very rapidly, and they do it very often. These three are all sharing with each other. So one of them has made a pillow and has given some stuff to this one over here, and that same one has said, okay, you're going to give me something, let me give you something. And he made a pillow and he's inserted it into that prokaryote, and they're all exchanging DNA. This is what we call bacterial sex, because the scientific definition of sex is exchange of a combination of DNA. This is the only time you'll ever really hear sex used with prokaryotes because they reproduce asexually. But this is their only way of sharing DNA with each other. So I said I would do this if I'm a prokaryote and I have an advantage that I want to share. See how smart you guys are. See how you can think. What's an advantage I may want to share? Okay. What if all of a sudden in the process of me reproducing and, you know, it's all asexual, but I'm in the process of splitting, mitosis, dividing, 
and all of a sudden my DNA is mutated in one of my offspring and Lysol doesn't kill him. What's going to happen? The next time somebody sprays Lysol, he's hanging out I'm like, well, hey, they're not dying from this. He's going to produce proteins that are making him resistant. He's going to give them to everybody else. Another thing would be antibiotic resistance. You've all heard about that, right? It's been on the news quite a bit lately. Antibiotic resistance occurs because of processes like this. All it takes is one bacteria figuring out how to live in the presence of an antibiotic, and he can give that to every other bacteria around him. So when you go to the doctor, and they give you a prescription of amoxicillin, and the directions say, take take one tablet twice a day for seven days and you get 14 pills. Why do you have to take all 14 pills? To kill it all. If you only take it for four days and then you say, hey, wait, I feel better, I'm going to save the other three days, you all all done this, right, for the next time I get sick, so I have to go to the doctor because it's expensive. What you've done is in those four days, you've killed most of the bacteria, but some of them are still alive. The ones that are alive, they've been living in the presence of antibiotic for four days. So one of those may have actually developed a resistance to it. And then he's going to give it to every other bacteria that comes in contact with you. And that's how we develop antibiotic resistant bacteria. It can be spontaneous too, but that's one of the leading ways that we develop that. So take home message of the day. When the doctor prescribes antibiotics, you take them. You won't save them for later. I say this knowing that I am married to somebody who will never listen to me. And he never takes all of his antibiotics. But I can promise you I do. And you even are supposed to take them at the same time every day to keep a certain concentration of that antibiotic in your body. That's, that's actually very important. Okay. Our last thing we're going to do together today, yay, last thing, is the prokaryotic cell wall. And some of these words are going to look bad. I know that. But I'm going to tell you what it means. And you don't have to spell them or anything like that. So it's not going to be that bad. First off, what's the cell wall for? Structure and shape. What's the first thing I taught you? All prokaryotes fit into one of these three shape categories, right? No matter what you do to them. So there's got to be something that makes them stay that shape. The cell wall is what makes them stay that shape. Okay. Now, there's other things the cell wall does, and I listed a bunch of them up there. But the most important thing the cell wall does is keep the cell the correct shape. Now, just a little aside, a good thing for us, most of our antibiotics we have developed recognize prokaryotic cell wall. Meaning that when you take an antibiotic, that antibiotic doesn't know, oop, good cell, leave it alone. Good cell, leave it alone. can't think. So you have to design the antibiotic to only bind to something we only see on a prokaryotic cell, right? Well, we usually use the cell wall because that prokaryotic cell wall is so different from any other chemical we see on eukaryotes. Prokaryotic cell walls are made of a chemical called peptidoglycan. I'm going to write it up here so I can show you guys a little bit about it. Peptidoglycan is a combination of peptides and the word glycan comes from the word glucose, which is a what? Sugar. Okay. So we know the part glycan tells us, all right, that means it's got some sugars in it, right? Does anybody know what a peptide is? Okay. What's a protein? What's it made of? Amino acids, right? Okay. This is just really annoying scientific terminology. Scientists love to make things complicated. Amino acids start hooking up together. Okay. When you only have a few of them, they're called peptides. You can have a dipeptide, a tripeptide, a tetrapeptide. That just means two, three, and four amino acids hooked together. You can have polypeptides, less than 300 amino acids hooked together, or you can have proteins, anything more than 300 amino acids hooked together. 
The only difference between a peptide and a protein is the size of it. Okay? So anytime you see the word peptide, that should make you think protein. It's just a small protein. That's all it is. Okay? So if we now just look at this, that word peptidoglycan looks kind of bad, right? But all that tells us is the cell wall of a prokaryotic cell is made of proteins and sugars. All right, and that's not complicated, right? All right, so let me show you the next part. The way it looks, you'll have a sugar connected to a sugar connected to a sugar. That'll be one layer. Then you'll have another layer, sugar, sugar, sugar. Well, that doesn't look real strong, right? Just a whole bunch of sugars. So the way the proteins work, the proteins are what links the layers of sugars together. That's all peptidoglycan is. Okay. So the way they draw it in your textbook are these little barrels. Each of the brownish pink looking barrels, that is the carbohydrate backbone. It's just the sugars, right? And then each layer of sugar has these little green and blue balls holding them together. Those are the little short proteins holding them together. Okay? So now let me say the bad words. The sugars are always going to be in acetyl glucosamine or in acetyl muramic acid. I know, sounds bad. Okay? But we abbreviate it so you don't have to constantly say those things. The first sugar may be in acetyl glucosamine. We abbreviate that one, NAG. The next sugar then would have to be in acetyl muramic acid, NAM. So the next one would be NAG. Next layer would work the same way. You'd have alternating NAG and NAM. Now I would never make you draw or recognize something like this, but I just want to show you what it is. These little rings right here, those are just glucose rings. The only thing that makes it in acetyl glucosamine instead of glucose is this little piece hanging off right here. This one's in acetyl muramic acid because it's got these two little pieces hanging off right here. But it's still just a basic, it's just a sugar with some extra stuff on it. Okay? Now, when you're reading through your textbook, they don't usually call these proteins, they call them peptides because they're just short proteins and they always are made of four amino acids. The way we say four is tetra. So you'll read these are tetra peptides. So how about it? Is that complicated? Let me say it in complex terms and see if you can understand it the way, the way you'd read it in your textbook. Okay? The prokaryotic cell wall is made of alternating sugars. Does that make sense? And the carbohydrate backbone that is connected by tetrapeptides. So see, if you had just read that sentence, that sounds bad, right? But it's not. It just means we got these big sugars. They always alternate with each other. The reason they alternate is just so you have room because one of them is a lot bigger on the bottom than the other. You've got to have a place for that little protein to stick in there. Okay? So you alternate them, and the way you hold the different layers together is you stick a little short protein called a tetrapeptide in there, and it holds it together. Okay? So that's what the prokaryotic cell wall is made of. There's two different arrangements that prokaryotic cell wall can take. And this was discovered by somebody named Dr. Graham. So he named them after himself. One arrangement is called Graham positive, and one arrangement is called Graham negative. And we're going to do this a lot in lab. So this is important in lecture and lab for you to understand. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. When he discovered these two different types, he didn't really know what it looked like on a molecular level. 
So there's going to be one part of it that you're going to think, why did he do this to us? And I, you'll see what that is in just a second. But what I want you guys to go do, those of you that print your notes, go ahead and put you a little note or a little star or something by this. This, you may as well just go ahead and memorize this. Because I'm going to ask you this on almost every test you take in this class. You have to know the difference between a gram positive and a gram negative cell. That's why I like to end the class with it so we can start with it again and repeat it next time. Okay? So here's the difference. If you just look at these two pictures, do they look different to you? They look different, right? I told you the little brown and pink barrels, that's the sugars, right? That's the nag and nam that are being held together. So which one of these has more layers of the peptidoglycan? The gram positive. That's the basic difference between them. Gram positive bacteria have a cell wall with more peptidoglycan. Gram negative bacteria have a cell wall with less peptidoglycan. Okay. Pretty much if you know that, you can usually at least pick out the differences in the pictures. But there's other differences that you do need to know. Another important difference is this guy over here hanging out on top of the peptidoglycan in the gram negative. That is called an outer membrane. For once, something has a decent name, right? It's the outer membrane. So this on the bottom, that's a plasma membrane. We'll review what that's made of next week. It's made of phospholipids, right? If you notice, the outer membrane looks a lot like the plasma membrane, right? I always like to look at this and say, that gram negative kind of looks like a sandwich. Then they're like two pieces of bread with some hot dog or something on the inside of it. So that's how I always recognize that's my gram negative. It looks like a sandwich. Okay? Here's the part that's bad, or I say bad, that's seems kind of irritating as to why he named them the way he did. The gram-positive bacteria have little chemical structures sticking out on the top called tachoic acids. Tachoic acid, lipotachoic acid, very similar. Okay? Tachoic acids are negatively charged. So I'm going to say a sentence, and then you're going to all give me a funny face. That means that the gram-positive cell wall is negatively charged. Okay, so let's say it again. Why is it called gram-positive? Because it has more peptidoglycan. That's why Graham said these are gram-positive. It's got plus, plus, plus. It's got more peptidoglycan. We're going to call this one gram-negative because he's minus some of that peptidoglycan. Fifty years later, we figured out gram positives have a chemical on them called tachoic acid. Therefore, gram positive cells are negatively charged. Seems kind of weird, right? Does it does it make sense? Okay, just kind of something you have to have to throw in there. This is really important when we start staining them. Because different dyes are going to stick to the gram positive because it's more negatively charged. So that's it's a real important distinction. Okay. The last thing on this little slide right here is that gram positive cells are more susceptible to phagocytosis and complement, meaning they're more likely to be destroyed by your immune system. And gram-negative cells are more susceptible to mechanical breakage. That means they're more likely to be squished, pulled apart. So let's see if we can reason why. Okay. The way your immune system cells destroy something is they have to pull it into themselves and figure out how to digest it and break it down into little pieces. Okay. So why would it be easier for me to eat this one? It's bigger, but if my mouth is big enough, I can grab a hold of that, right? Once I grab a hold of this cell wall, I only have to figure out how to break down one thing, right? Peptidoglycan. I've got to break down a lot of it, but that's the only thing I have to have enzymes to break down. If I come over here and I try to eat this one, I have to have enzymes to first break down the outer membrane, then I have to have a new set of enzymes to break down the peptidoglycan. 
Does that make sense? So it's a little easier for your body to destroy the gram-positive bacteria. Even though they may be thicker, they're just not made of quite as many different things. So that's what that one means. With the gram-negative being easier to mechanically break, what is easier for you to tear? Two sheets of paper connected together or 20 sheets of paper connected together? Two, right? He's got different parts to him, right? But he's thinner. Since the gram-negative is thinner, it's easier for him to be torn and physically broken down. This guy, he doesn't have the outer membrane, but he's super thick. So it's hard to destroy something that is that thick simply by smushing it. Okay. Why does that matter? Which one is going to be most likely to cause disease in your body, gram positive or gram negative? Gram negative, right? Your immune system can't break him down quite as fast. See, we are learning things you are going to use later on. Right. Do you have any 